right, so my name is Morgan Robertson, and these are some of the things that I do. Um, I'm a DevOps engineer at AppSumbler, um, and we're an open edX solutions provider. So we do hosting, customization, um, and support for open edX. Uh, my role is mostly focused on deploying and managing our infrastructure um, and ensuring the robust robustness and scalability of our applications. Um, so I spend a lot of my time writing Ansible code and working with Docker and Kubernetes, of course. Um, I spend my free time being concerned about privacy online, and so I run a bunch of Tor relays. So if you enjoy this talk, you can run your own Tor relay and name it after me or something. Um, and then I also do Python development and play around with Raspberry Pi. Um, so this talk is about how we're using Kubernetes to deploy OpenEdX and how Kubernetes provides uh, a foundation that makes it easy to deploy, scale, and maintain robustness for applications. So first I'll give you some background um, about OpenEdX and our traditional way of deploying it. Um, and then I'll talk about our vision for deploying OpenEdX using Kubernetes and some of the specific Kubernetes features that we're using. So OpenEdX is the open source education platform that powers edX.org. Um, it's a web application that's primar primarily developed by edX, which is a nonprofit founded by MIT and Harvard. Um, so edX.org offers over 500 online courses and has reached over 5 million students. Um, the OpenEdX software was initially released back in June of 2013 and there are now two to three major releases per year. Um, there are a wide range of organizations that use open edX, uh, ranging from universities offering courses to students, uh, to private companies that want to offer internal trainings for their employees or courses for their own customers. Uh, so OpenEdX is a relatively complex application and consists of quite a few components. Um, so the two core components are the learning management system and the content management system, um, known as the LMS and CMS respectively. So the LMS is what students interact with, um, and this is where students can view course materials, uh, watch lectures and do homework assignments. Uh, the, the CMS uh, is what instructors use to construct courses and upload course content. Um, and both the, the LMS and the CMS are Django apps written in Python. Um, and then the forum is another major component. This is essentially an online discussion board uh, where students can talk about the course or ask their peers for help with homework assignments. And then on the back end, um, OpenEdX uses two different data stores, MongoDB and MySQL. Um, and then aside from these core components, there are a lot of other services, um, such as Celery and RabbitMQ for running asynchronous tasks, uh, Memcache, Nginx to provide the, the front end uh, web server, um, Elasticsearch, and Hadoop for processing data analytics, or for performing data analytics. So this is an architectural di diagram of some of the major components of OpenEdX. And the main takeaway here is that there are a lot of things, and a lot of the things talk to a lot of other things. Um, so OpenEdX is only a few years old at this point, but it was still designed in the pre-Docker days when things were intended to run on VMs rather than in containers. Um, so as you might imagine, uh, it was quite a challenge to take OpenEdX, containerize it, and get it running on Kubernetes. Uh, but the good news in all of this is that OpenEdX is fairly modular and uh, most of the services communicate using standard protocols like HTTP.
So before we get into how to run OpenEdX on Kubernetes, uh, I want to give you an idea of our traditional non-Kubernetes way of deploying OpenEdX. So in a nutshell, we have a bunch of walled gardens. Uh, we run everything on Google Compute Engine. And so essentially for each customer deployment, uh, we have a separate dedicated uh, G Cloud project with a number of VMs. Um, so for our smaller customers, we might have just a single VM running the entire OpenEdX stack. Uh, for larger customers who are more concerned about uh, scalability and robustness, uh, we might have dedicated servers for MySQL, um, a Mongo replica set, and then uh, multiple servers running the LMS and CMS. So besides our customer deployments, we also have a test drive service where potential customers can uh, spin up an open edX stack running inside a Docker container. And so if that's not clear, um, we basically have this single huge Docker container for each test drive that contains the entire open edX stack. So the LMS, the CMS, the forums, Nginx, Celery Workers, Mongo, and MySQL. And so these containers are stateful. They have dozens of running processes. And we know that we're committing this horrible abuse of Docker, um, but we're well aware of it. And we're, we're aware of all of the issues that arise from this abuse. Um, and so obviously, the Docker whale is not too happy about this. Um, so in terms of scalability, you can see that there, there are a lot of problems uh, with how we currently deploy things. Uh, so with the test drive service, um, each container is very resource intensive, especially in terms of memory. Um, and the different services can't be shared between containers. Um, and because these containers take so many resources, we can only demo the core features of OpenEdX. Uh, we can't show cust or potential customers some of the more advanced features like course certificates or course analytics. And then for our customer deployments running on Google Compute Engine, uh, we have similar problems. Uh, we can't share uh, the various services comprising OpenEdX between deployments. And so we're essentially just wasting resources. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there's a new major release of OpenEdX every few months. Um, and so when we upgrade, we have to upgrade each deployment individually. And so that makes for an extremely painful upgrade process uh, that just doesn't scale. Uh, so right now, AppSumbler as a company is growing, and we're taking on a lot of new customers. And as I said before, um, our traditional way of deploying OpenEdX doesn't scale, and it's just not feasible anymore. So our vision is basically this. Uh, we want to have a multi-tenant multi deployment of OpenEdX uh, that's running on Kubernetes, which will allow us to scale, um, push new features more frequently and with greater confidence and result in a more efficient use of resources and ultimately lower cost. So we're just about to launch the alpha of a new product called AppSumbler Management Console. And this essentially provides user management within OpenEdX. Um, and so we'll have a single OpenEdX deployment. Um, but each user, to each user, it will appear that they have their own OpenEdX instance. Um, and so when we combine this with Kubernetes, uh, this will make for a scalable and robust solution that should be able to serve hundreds or thousands of customers and tens to hundred, hundreds of thousands of students. All right, so now let's discuss Kubernetes and why we're choosing it to serve as the basis for our SaaS offering of OpenEdX. So Docker Swarm is great. Um, we've been using it since it was in beta. 
Uh, we use it for one of our products in production right now. Um, but to provide the basis for a highly scalable um, enterprise solution where we have lots of different services talking to one another, uh, we think that Kubernetes ultimately wins out. Um, so Kubernetes has really nice built-in service discovery. Um, and the, so Docker, Docker now supports multi-host networking, um, but service discovery is still extremely primitive. Um, Kubernetes also has a lot of other nice built-in features like uh, container auto-scaling, um, pretty rich support for health checking, uh, secret management, and the ability to deploy rolling updates. And so if we add console to Swarm and Compose, uh, we can get pretty rich service discovery and health checking features. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, Kubernetes just provides a lot, of, a lot more built-in features out of the box. Um, and so, and it's also really easy for us to deploy with Google Container Engine. All right, so we've established that Kubernetes provides many of the features that we need to, uh, to run a scalable and robust application in production. And so now the challenge is to take a, a complex web application uh, that was designed to run on VMs and adapt it to run on Kubernetes. So to run open edX on Kubernetes, the first thing we have to do is containerize all the components. Uh, so fortunately, edX provides an open source configuration repo uh, that automates the uh, installation and configuration of each component using Ansible. Uh, so for the most part, each component that comprises open edX has a corresponding Ansible role um, and so to build our Docker images, we essentially just run these Ansible roles as part of the Docker build process. Uh, so this is a simplified view of one of our uh, Docker files, um, and this is for building the forum service. Uh, so you'll notice here at the bottom, um, we're just running Ansible playbook as one of our build steps. And so we're running Ansible locally inside the container. Um, and we're running a playbook called forum.yaml, and this just calls the, the rules needed to um, install the forum service. So this includes things like cloning the, the, the forum repo from GitHub, um, installing all of the dependencies and necessary packages, um, and creating any config files we need for the forum service. And then another thing you'll notice here is that we're extending Fusion Base Image. And Fusion, Fusion Base Image is a modified Ubuntu image um, that's tweaked a little bit to, to run inside Docker. Um, and so the reason for this is because many, many of the OpenEdX services actually consists, consist of multiple processes that are fairly tightly coupled. Um, and so in the long run, we'd like to sort of separate these out into multiple containers running within the same pod. Um, but it's going to be a lot of hard work. And so right now, uh, we're using Fusion Base Image because it has um, a pretty lightweight init process built in called run it. Um, and so that allows us to, to manage multiple processes within a single container. All right, so once we've done all of the hard work of building our images with Docker, it's actually fairly straightforward to deploy everything on Kubernetes. And so for the most part, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between our services and replication controllers. Um, so for example, um, we have an edX app service, an edX app replication controller, um, and the replication controller creates edX app pods. 
Um, and so this architecture um, allows us to scale each service independently. Um, and so for example, we, we anticipate needing to scale the edX app service, which is the front end web application, a lot more than we need to scale the forum. Um, and with our, with our old way of doing deployments, um, it was much more difficult to, uh, to scale these components independently. Um, and then one other thing you'll notice here is that we have Mongo and MySQL running on non-Kubernetes backends, uh, but Kubernetes services still makes it easy to talk to these other backends that are not running in pods. So as I just said, um, we're, we're not running Mongo or, or MySQL on Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has pretty rich support for different types of volumes, um, including network file systems like NFS and ClusterFS, and even GC persistent disks. Um, so for, for performance reasons, we, we want to uh, have our Mongo data store on an SSD. Um, and so if you try to run Mongo and Kubernetes, you'll start running into issues um, around scheduling because you, you need your uh, Mongo pods to be on um, a machine uh, with an SSD and a Mongo data store. Um, it's also difficult to, to bootstrap a Mongo replica set in a dynamic system where pods are going up and down. Um, and so for the time being, we just found it easier to deploy a Mongo replica set on a set of VMs. Um, and so if you, if you saw this talk earlier um, on state, um, it should be more feasible to, to run Mongo and other database systems on Kubernetes in the near, in the near future. But at the moment, it's still a pretty difficult problem to tackle. Um, and then for our relational data store, we're using Google Cloud SQL. So this is a fully managed uh, MySQL instance in the cloud. Um, it has automated backups. You can configure master-slave replication just by checking a box. Um, and so it's extremely easy to set up. And so for us, this was kind of a no-brainer. Um, it's much easier to just use a hosted SQL service rather than try to deploy our own. Um, so normally Kubernetes relies on labels and label selectors uh, to match services to backend pods. Uh, so when you have external services um, like say you have an application running on a VM rather than in a pod, uh, there's one extra step that you have to go through um, to get everything talking. Um, and that is to explicitly create um, an endpoint. And so uh, this is an example of an endpoint that we've created for Mongo. And so you'll see that it's essentially just listing the IPs um, of the VMs in our Mongo replica set. And so this endpoint object essentially just allows services to know where to route traffic. All right, so once we spin up our Kubernetes cluster running OpenEdX, um, there are several initialization tasks that we need to do once. Um, so these tasks include things like uh, creating users and tables in MySQL, um, collecting static assets for the Django application, um, and other sorts of things that you need to, to do once. Um, so once, once each of these tasks is complete, uh, the pod running the task should exit and be cleaned up. Um, so Kubernetes 1.1 introduced a feature called jobs um, that's actually perfect for these sorts of tasks. Um, and so what a job does is it creates one or, one or more pods that run to completion. 
Um, and so if you have a task that you need to run, to run once until it's successful, then a job will help you manage this. So if, if one of your pods fails, um, then you can automatically rerun that pod until it succeeds. Um, and so here we have an example of, of a job for initializing our MySQL database. And so you'll notice the restart policy is on failure. So we'll try to run this pod. If it fails, it'll be rerun again. Um, once it succeeds um, and our database has been initialized properly, um, this job will, will be finished and not run again. So in the Django world, it's fairly common to store secrets as plain text JSON files just sitting on your production server. And that probably sounds terrible, and it is, but that's the way that OpenEdX does it by default. Um, and so with a traditional installation of OpenEdX, we run Ansible. Um, Ansible uses some templates to generate these configuration files, and then it just dumps them on the server. Um, and then the Django web app can read those files. Um, so in a containerized world, we want to build generic reusable images that we can upload to Docker Hub or a public repository. And so we don't want to have our secrets baked into those images. Um, so to get around that, we're using Kubernetes secrets uh, to pass our secret JSON files into pods at runtime. So in Kubernetes, um, essentially what you do is you take your secret, you base64 encode it, and then you pass it to the Kubernetes API. And then pods can access secrets by mounting them as volumes and reading secrets in as files. Um, secret volumes are tempfs file systems. And so everything is stored in RAM, and there's no risk of accidentally writing your secrets to disk. Uh, for monitoring, we're currently using Google Cloud Monitoring. Um, and it, it integrates really nicely with Google Container Engine. Um, so as you can see, um, it can monitor resources both on the host nodes and within containers. You can also configure alerts based on any, any resource that you can monitor. Um, and we've looked into some other monitoring tools like Sysdig, uh, but found that cloud monitoring is sufficient for our needs right now. Uh, so, so we think that Sysdig um, is probably richer in terms of the features that it provides. Um, it has this really nice drill down view, uh, but for the moment, uh, cloud monitoring uh, is sufficient for us, and it, it's really easy to set up if you're running on Google Compute Engine. So throughout this process, we've, we've learned quite a few lessons. Um, so the first one is that if you're taking an existing, an existing ap application that was written to run on VMs, it can be a lot of work to containerize. Um, if, if an application is not written to run in containers from the start, then there can be a lot of tightly coupled components. Um, you might rely on an init system like system D. Um, and so taking applications like that and containerizing them can be pretty difficult. But once you have things containerized, it's generally pretty straightforward to deploy your application on Kubernetes. Um, all you have to do is write your YAML files for pods and services, and then you just run it, and it works. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is that not every component of your application has to be containerized to work with Kubernetes. Um, so again, you can use Kubernetes services uh, to talk to external backends. So if you want to run Mongo or MySQL or whatever database system you use, um, on VMs or 
um, from a cloud service, then you can do that um, and still talk to it using Kubernetes. All right, so that's all I have. Thanks for listening. Um, I guess we have time for questions. Sorry, could you speak up, please? Um, okay, um, so the question was about have we considered any uh, key value stores for storing secrets? And so I've looked into HashiCorp's vault a little bit, and I think that this is probably the route that we want to pursue in the long run. Um, it's, it may be a little difficult just because of the, the structure of these JSON files that store the secrets. Um, I mean, it's, it's arbitrary JSON, and so you have um, lots of nested uh, dictionaries and lists and things. Um, so, so getting this format into a, a general key value store might take some work, but I, I think that would be a better direction to go than just using uh, Kubernetes secrets. Yep. Right. Um, so it depends who you talk to, but some people consider it bad practice to run more than one process per container. Um, so I don't see anything inherently bad about it, <laughs> except that we have this extra overhead of this init process. Um, I think just for the sake of isolation and reusability, it's probably better to, to run one process per container in general, um, but we haven't really seen any ill effects from doing that. Yeah. Uh, are you talking about development, like in terms of building images? Right, so, so currently we just have a test cluster set up basically, and so we'll build an image and then deploy it to the cluster. Um, because we have so many components that need to interact, um, it's really difficult to, to test a single image in isolation. Yep. Right. Um, so we haven't really done formal cost analysis with this yet. Um, we're still rolling out basically this alpha phase um, of our open edX SaaS offering. Um, so the fact that we weren't able to share resources between uh, different deployments before, um, I, think, I think it's pretty clear that we're, we're gonna save money this way. Um, so currently, we, we only need a few VMs, um, like mid-sized VMs for deploying um, everything on Kubernetes. And that's clearly a, a lot better than having multiple machines for each of you know, dozens of customers. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right. So that is our hope. <laughs> um, so with Kubernetes, it's it's pretty trivial to to scale your containers, right? Like you essentially specify the number of each type of pod you want, um, and then Kubernetes will do the work of actually scaling it. Um, so our our largest customer right now has about thirty thousand students, um, and we can handle that just fine um, using our traditional deployment on VMs. Um, and so yeah, we're we're hoping that. Under Kubernetes, we can scale to hundreds of thousands of students. Are you not worried about um, multi tenancy inside of a Kubernetes cluster? You've got multiple people, customers that are using the same cluster. If they have pods happen to be scheduled on the same node, then one of them is doing a lot of running in terms of disk operations. It's going to impact on another cluster. Um, so the multi tenancy is happening in OpenEdX itself. Um, so we have this sort of front-end component called AppSembler Management Console, and this is managing all of the users within OpenEdX. Um, and so really, like on the back end, this is, you can think of it as a single OpenEdX deployment. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Not really. I mean, it, uh, <coughs> Kubernetes doesn't specify guarantees for things like this Right. So if they happen to be on the same bit of hardware, you can have one pod impacting the performance of another pod. Sure. Um, so yeah, we haven't. I guess we haven't run into that problem yet. So I don't have a good answer for you. But sure, it's it's something to keep in mind, I guess. Any other questions? Thank you, Morgan. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.